In this next unit, we talk about unforgiveness and trauma. Ed Laframboise will come up and give us a talk about how his experience with Jesus, his encounter with Jesus, helped him recognize his need to be rescued. And then Anthony will come and talk about trauma in the life of another and how in the Bible, God gives us a prescription for how we're supposed to respond to the trauma that occurs in our life so that we can be healed. So there's two stories, both about betrayal and trauma. What is the response that we have? What is the response that God calls us to? And how we can be rescued? Hello, brothers and sisters. My name is Ed Laframboise. Um, myself, uh, with my bride Jessica, and our six boys, our parishioners here at Our Lady of Good Counsel Parish. Um, if you don't mind, I would like you to join me in a quick prayer so that this testimony will be about him and nothing else, and I keep to my allotted time. And for those who know me, um, that could be an issue, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my very best. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Father, you are a good, good Father. Please send down your Spirit upon us and remain in us so that we may be awakened by your presence and recognize the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, at work in this world that is so desperately in need of good news. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to testify about the good news of Jesus Christ in my life about what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do for me, and what he has done, is doing, and wants to do for each of you. Before I was rescued by Jesus Christ, I was lost and seesawing between self-righteousness and unworthiness. Uh, my self-righteousness was wrapped up in me attributing all the good things in my life to what I had done, what I had earned or deserved. Um, such as career success or, or, or money or um, status. Um, and my unworthiness on the other side was um, depression, um, depression from past hurts, uh, not, not feeling good enough about myself or not being worthy because of, of past mistakes. Um, and, and I was consumed, uh, consumed by my self-will, um, what, what one priest affectionately called the, the me monster, or not so affectionately, I, I guess. And, and my personal idols, which for me are, are power, money, and status, which I think are popular with a lot of people, but, but they particularly resound in, in, in how my life unfolded. Um, and I was bearing little fruit for, the, for building up of the kingdom, and there was so much wasted time. And all of this was in spite of being raised as, a, as a, a cradle Catholic Christian and raised in a devout and prayerful home. Um, I, I believe that evil initially entered into my life in two predominant ways. Um, one, is, as I mentioned, from a past hurt. I'm, I was the victim of child sexual abuse at a, at a very young age, and there was trauma from that associated with the, the repression and dealing with those, those issues at a, as, as, a, as a late teenager. Um, in addition, stemming from that, there was unforgiveness associated with the, the perpetrator and, and other people involved with, um, with those um, evil circumstances. Um, and, and secondly, what I'll call a, a, a form of generational sin and, and not being a theologian, I don't know if I'm accurate with that or not, but I, there were people close to me in my life as I was being raised and formed that showed me it was okay to lead a duplicitous life, right? It was okay to be one way at home and one way at church or one way with friends and one way, um, one way with work friends or one way with street friends or one way with church friends. And, and that, the devil knew what he was doing um, by playing those things on me because it was a powerful set of circumstances that when combined with my 
not small ego and not small self-will, um, it, it really enabled the devil to play me. Um, play me like a fiddle to the tune of the world in the flesh, which on its surface can seem very, very attractive. And when you have a large ego and a large self-will, it, it, you are left with an uncanny ability to rationalize it all away. Um, and so what ensued? Reckless and selfish behavior ensued in various forms, um, cementing me deeper in thinking that it is okay to be one way at home, one way at work, one way at church, so on and so forth. Um, I was playing a different role in each circumstance, a, a chameleon, if you would, but never leaving me being my true self. I don't think I need to go into all the details about my, my reckless and, and, and poor choices, but I do want to share about my struggles with alcohol because I, I believe that was a central point, um, the Lord you know, getting to me. Um, I started drinking at a young age, um, early teens, um, and it was a constant in my life from that time until um, you know, about, about three years ago. Um, and it was, it, it, was, it, was, it was social, it was status, it was a form of self-medication, um, but it was always something that I, could, that I could turn to. And as I look back on it, it was, it was a very severe and significant hook that the world, the flesh, and the devil had in me. And, you know, it was, it was routine to party and get drunk, um, whether I was a teenager or in college or even in a professional, in a professional setting. And I, I, I made poor choices. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more later as we talk about how the Lord came into my life. Um, so my wife, our family had just become parishioners at Our Lady of Good Counsel and Alpha was being promoted as a unique way to encounter Christ or, or re-encounter for me, as it were, as I had had fleeting encounters with him um, as, as, a young, as a younger person, preteen and, and young adult life. Um, our friends, the Van Disses, had gone through Alpha and raved about the experience. Um, we had not previous, my wife and I, we had not previously been involved in parish programs, but we signed up anyway. Um, and Alpha offered me a life-changing encounter with the risen Jesus through the Word of God, thoughtful discussion, and fellowship. God takes the first step. Grace always comes first. Jesus was knocking on the door to my heart, and Alpha was me opening the door to my heart, and there he was saying to me, what took you so long? And once the door was open, the love of Jesus consumed me and consumes me to this day. It, it, was a, it was a gradual waterfall. It, it, I know that makes no sense, but it, it was gradual in the sense that it transpired over a long period of time. It's not like I just woke up and was like, you know, Jesus, Jesus praise hands, right? That was not that's something I had to grow into. And, and even still, you know, I have to, to work with my, my comfort levels and, and humbling myself for how the Lord, Lord and the Spirit want to move in my life. Um, but it was a waterfall in the sense that of the immensity of Christ's constant love. And recognizing that, it just made me desire to want to know him more intimately through his word, um, parish programs, um, spiritual reading, podcast. Um, most importantly, the last two of spending time with him in prayer and, and getting to know him better and letting him speak to me and put things on my heart rather than me just asking for things. And then, and service, real service to others, which doesn't mean saving the world necessarily, but, but meant being a better husband, being a better father, um, being a better representative of, of, uh, of what a Christian is supposed to be. Um, in the middle of this journey, I was arrested for a DUI. And it was not my first, it was my second. Um, but the circumstances of my second DUI were much different as now I was a husband, um, a father, um, and um, you know, uh, a person in, in, in society. I was, just wasn't some reckless youth um, anymore. And, and the Lord, and this wasn't long ago, right? This, this was July of 2017, so it's not 
that far away that I can't, I can't remember, that it's still vivid for me. Um, the Lord hit me with a sledgehammer. The weight of the powerlessness I felt about my pending consequences, whether that be court-related or family-related, was, it was, it was so much to bear. And, and the reality of my selfishness and foolishness, I, I could have killed someone. I could have went to jail. I lost my job as a, as a husband who's committed to a, a woman to be with her you know, for the rest of the, their life as one flesh and, and to raise up children. I, I, I put so much at, at, at risk for, for, for what? And, and it, was, it was crushing. And I believe we're all crushed. We're all broken in some way. I could feel the Lord on my heart telling me this was the time to choose. And there were only two choices. I had to choose to humble myself and follow the Lord where I didn't want to go, confronting my idols and my, trans and my transgressions through a deep and never-ending constant conversion, or to run from him. I dropped to my knees, cried out to the Lord, and chose humility and surrender and that is when he really went to work on me. Humility and weakness always lead to gratitude. I became thankful for this horrible event in my life, not because of the event, but what the Lord was able to do through it. I have an image of the Lord um, that since this time that he is, uh, he is the sword maker, and I am a rough piece of metal being fashioned through fire or purification, and pounding or molding into his sort of truth. It's painful during the process, no doubt, and it happens over and over again. You get taken, put in the fire and pounded out and put back in the fire and pounded through again. But, but, I can't, but you can't argue with the result. Not that I'm anything special at this point in time, but I know what a piece of metal fashioned by a proper swords, swords maker, what that can look like. And it goes into from a black, ugly piece of metal to a beautiful, shiny, um, useful tool um, that can be used in the world. So I, I came to believe in my heart that the Jesus Christ of history is the Son of God. He is the suffering servant who poured himself out on the cross to rob death of its sting and take back what is rightfully his, namely me and you and all of his creation. Not only did he do all these things 2,000 years ago, he is doing all these things now for me and you as he is alive. There is nothing I can do to earn this outpouring of love, but this love requires a response from me and you. So what is the proper response? And I, I look to his word. In Matthew 16, 25, he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And I believe that by offering my life as a living sacrifice, emptying myself, taking the form of a servant for God and my neighbor, I will not waste any of his grace. I would like to end with a passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered into Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature. So he ran out ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste. And come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when he saw it, they all murmured. He had gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I can identify with Zacchaeus. 
I love money. I'm a sinner. I'm small of stature. <laughs> but I know that the Lord called me to save and seek me. And he did it first. And I have but to say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. In closing, in his still small voice, God has put on my heart to share this with you. God the Father has a great plan for you and calls you by name through his son, Jesus, the rescuer. Make haste and come to me just as you are. I know you. I love you. You have nothing to fear. Open wide the door of your heart, for I must be with you today. The king of the, the universe came to seek and save you. Praise, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you are unlimited. Jesus, we thank you that you are unlimited. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are God and you are unlimited. And Father, I lift up every single person that is watching this healing conference right now. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come upon them right where they are, to grab a hold of their hearts and to draw us together to Jesus. We open up our hearts to you right now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I want to begin in Psalm 105, beginning in verse 16. It says, When he summoned a famine on the land, and broke every staff of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, his feet were hurt with shackles. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. I want to remind you of a very traumatic story. It's about Joseph. He was 17 years old when his trauma began. His father loved him more than any of his other children. And for this reason, Joseph's brothers hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. But Joseph, like you, had a calling on his life. God gave him dreams about this calling. Joseph's voiced these dreams to his family. And the Bible says they only hated him more for his dreams and his words. And his brothers were jealous of him. The Bible says that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Hateful words spoken over our lives or jealousy towards us can be very traumatic and distressing to our soul, to our emotions. But this hatred and this jealousy against Joseph was only the beginning for him. These same brothers betrayed him and sold him. They saw him afar off and conspired to kill him. One of his brothers, Reuben, thankfully talked them out of it. Yet when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe and cast him into a pit. And for some pieces of silver, they betrayed him and they sold him into slavery. Can you imagine the trauma, the temptation to become bitter? They took Joseph's robe and the Bible says they dipped it in blood. They lied to their father who entered into a season of deep grief and loss, all based on a lie. And then Joseph was sold into Potiphar's house and he continued to be blessed and to find favor. Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household. And that's when Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph. And he could have done it. 
He was hurt. He had pain in his life. He probably needed to, to mask that pain to make it feel a little bit better, to feel a little bit of relief. He had the chance. He could have. But rather than sin, the Bible says he fled out of the house of sin. Joseph was then falsely accused and put into prison. The trauma continued. But God continued to show Joseph mercy and favor. The Bible says the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. And God will show us mercy also and favor when we run from our sin, like Joseph did. And he will be with us and make us prosper, even in the prison of our distress and our suffering. But while Joseph was still in prison, he had more dreams. Joseph's gifts and callings continued to emerge, just like yours do. Why? Remember this. Remember, he was stolen out of his land. He had done nothing wrong. He was wrongfully thrown into a dungeon, and he was forgotten. But he remained faithful. Two years passed in that prison. And then another man had a dream. His name was Pharaoh. And Joseph was brought up out of the dungeon to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And God spoke to him. And at the age of 30, Joseph rose to power. And it was around that time he had two sons. New life came into his family. The first son's name was Manasseh. God has made me forget all of my hardship. His second son was Ephraim. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And God can do the same in your life. And it was just as Joseph began to experience the healing of this new season and this new life that Joseph's brothers showed up again. The very ones who caused all the misery in Joseph's life showed up bowing to him. Your traumatic experience does not have the power to stop God's dream from coming to pass in your life. Have you ever noticed that the triggers of traumatic events in our lives always seem to show up when we least expect it? See, Joseph knew his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. He had changed. So Joseph tested them, and he began to notice something, that they had also changed. Even Judah, the one who suggested selling him into slavery 13 years before, when Joseph detained Benjamin, the youngest brother, it was Judah who was willing to take the little brother's place. But still, Joseph could have taken vengeance. He had the right. They wronged him. They caused him this severe trauma. But instead, Joseph wept and made himself known to his brothers. And he said, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, for God sent me before you to preserve life. And then we see Joseph do something very beautiful, just like you can do. He forgave his brothers. But his brothers feared that Joseph, they said, Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil we did to him. And Joseph's father pleaded, forgive them, I beg you, forgive your brothers the transgre their transgression and their sin because they did evil to you. His brothers begged, forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph did not harden himself, he wept. And they bowed their knee to him again. And in Genesis chapter 50, the Bible says, Joseph said to them, fear not, am I in the place of God? You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. Do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Joseph reassured them. He comforted them. He forgave them. He spoke blessing over their lives. And he was restored. And the family was restored. And Joseph died in faith with his father's blessing upon his life. He knew who God was, and he knew his brother's motives were evil, and he saw God's plan in every bit of it, and he forgave. What about you? You can. 
you can forgive. For many years later, someone else whom Joseph foreshadowed was born, who should suffer so much trauma for us, and his name is Jesus. For he will save his people. Like Joseph, he entered into his ministry at about 30 years of age. And like Joseph, his brothers hated him and conspired to kill him. And like Joseph, one of those closest to him sold him for some pieces of silver. And like Joseph, they stripped him of his robe, they mocked him, they spit upon him, they struck him, they oppressed him and afflicted him, they judged and wounded him, they bruised him and chastised him, they whipped his back. Our sin caused so much trauma to his soul and to his body. The Bible says he was marred beyond human appearance. And this is how he made himself known to us. They crucified him. Hanging upon the cross, he looks at his brothers and he looks at you right now, wherever you are. And he looks at those who have caused trauma in your life, those who have caused the most pain in your life. And he says, just like Joseph, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there on that cross, Jesus took your unforgiveness. He took your betrayal. He took your rejection, your sorrow, your grief. He took your pain from being despised and hated and misunderstood. He took your transgressions, your iniquities, the chastisement that you deserved, your oppression, your afflictions, your judgment, your wounds, your bruises, your travail, your sickness, your disease, all of your trauma. And he's saying today, with my stripes, you were healed. With my stripes, you were healed. Jesus is saying right now, look to me. My eyes are like a flame of fire, and my head, on my head are many diadems. And like Joseph, I also have a robe dipped in blood, and my name is the Word of God. Like Joseph, I also rule. Jesus is saying, for I am. I am King of kings and Lord of lords. I am faithful and true and righteous. I took the trauma of the world to heal you. I am the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and I have taken your place. Come, bury your wounds in mine. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lovely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They meant evil for you, but God meant it for good, to bring about the salvation and healing of many people through your story. Do not fear, be reassured by your heavenly Father. Be comforted, he has always been with you. Like Joseph, Jesus rose out of the pit in death's prison and sits in power and authority over all of heaven and earth. The shackles are falling off. The collar of iron around your neck is being broken. What God has said about you is true. Yes, his word has tested you but his word is coming to pass in your life. Be released, be set free, rise up out of the pit and prison of your sins and their consequences in the name of Jesus. For at the name of Jesus, every knee, yours, all of your pain, and every person who ever hurt you, every knee must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right there where you are, focus your heart, focus your mind on Jesus. And just sit there and whisper and say, Jesus, please come. I welcome you. Come, Holy Spirit. Move in my heart, move in my life. Jesus, I thank you that you are our healer. Move with your healing anointing through every single home, every single individual, every single person under the sound of my voice right now. I ask you for your healing anointing to come and to touch soul and body in the name of Jesus. Right there where you are. People are coming up in your mind that have hurt you. And the Lord is calling you to choose to forgive them. And just begin to pray right there wherever you are. Jesus, I forgive 
whoever it is. I forgive my mom. I forgive my dad. I forgive my siblings. I forgive. Begin to pray that out wherever you are. Lift them up to the Lord. Speak blessing over their lives. And invite the Holy Spirit right now into your heart and into your situation, into the depths of your heart. And receive your healing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Jesus Messiah 
Now we're gonna go through a four-step journey in forgiveness. As we sit here with Jesus, after hearing Anthony's powerful exhortation, John has put up the steps on the screen for you to pray with and go through. And so now as Tom begins to play, let's begin the journey. The first step is to uncover the wound. Enter into the hurt and pain. Who hurt you? What emotions did you experience? Where were you hurt? How deeply? Next, reflect on your emotions. What came out of that wound? How did it affect your daily life? What are your thoughts about the person who hurt you? What judgments have you made about that person? What judgments are you still making about that person? The second step in the forgiveness journey is to choose a different way. Likely the person that hurt you cannot give back what they took. When we insist on getting back that thing, we, we fall into this pattern and then we get stuck. It's important to realize that we are all powerless. We need Jesus. And it is through the strength of Jesus that we are given the grace that we need to forgive. Next, you need to ask yourself, am I able to forego the debt that I'm owed? Let me say that again. Am I able to forego the debt that I'm owed? Can I let go of the payment that I think I deserve? Can I let go of the punishment that I want for that person that hurt me so badly? Invite Jesus right into that place right now. Ask the Lord for the desire and the actual grace to forgive that person. Now, make an act of the will to forgive. Say, I choose forgiveness, Lord. I choose forgiveness. And then again, ask God for that grace. So now as we're doing that, we're gonna enter into that third step. And it's working on forgiveness in prayer. This is difficult because I'm asking you to ask the Holy Spirit to see the life story of the person that hurt you. So I'm asking you to ask the Lord to open your eyes and your heart to that pain and suffering, the wounds, that life journey that that person has taken. Perhaps it's generational sin that they've lived with. Perhaps it's abuse. But I'm asking you to ask the Lord to see that person's life. Can you see that person through the heart of the Lord? Can you see their pain? Can you see their hurts? Their wounds? Can you offer that person a gift? An act of mercy? Can you see how their pain, their wounds directly affected you? When you get to this point, can you offer a prayer of forgiveness? I'm gonna ask you if, you if you'd like to close your eyes. And as you're there, just pr praying for the Holy Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 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 Take that person, that person that hurt you, that wounded you, right to the foot of the cross. 
Are you there? Are you there right beneath the cross with Mother Mary and that person in you? Ask Mary to wrap her arms about both of you. She is your loving mother, and she's the mother to that person too. Ask her to surround both of you under her mantle of protection. And it is precisely at that moment, now ask Jesus to forgive that person. Turn to that person and say, I choose to forgive. I pray for healing and restoration. Ask Jesus to bless and heal both of you. Say, Lord, heal us. Pour your blessing out upon both of us. I ask for your blessing upon our lives and our eternal souls. Lord, please come, heal us. This is a powerful moment because Jesus shed every ounce of his blood for you, for me, and for those people in our lives that have hurt us so profoundly. Come, come Lord, heal those wounds. And now I just ask you to give a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank the Lord for all that he has done, all that he's doing at this moment, all that he'll continue to do in your healing process. Praise you, Lord, praise you. I thank you for this healing. I'm claiming it now and as I go forward. This next step is to embrace the freedom Perhaps for some of you, you felt it right away. For some of you, it will be a journey. But embrace what has happened here as you're sitting with the Lord, truly present in the monstrance. A lack of forgiveness keeps the chains around you. But an act of forgiveness frees you and breaks you free of those chains. Notice the difference. You're no longer demanding the payment due you. You're free from it, and so is that person. Live in the light of forgiveness. It's very different from living in the, light, in the darkness of unforgiveness. It's important to acknowledge and understand by doing this process that the pain and suffering did exist. It was very real what you went through. We're not minimizing any of that. But as you unite your suffering to Christ's suffering, you can make it redemptive. Especially if anything is remaining, offer it to Jesus, hanging right there with you on the cross. Attach your suffering to his. These feelings are real, so just hand them right over. It's important to realize it's not an instant process. Just like going to the doctor, sometimes we need to address different hurts and wounds. But each trauma can be and needs to be attended to. Each wound is different and unique, and the Lord has a unique remedy for each one of those. Only the Lord knows exactly what is needed. And so today, as you went through perhaps one of those wounds and trauma, continue to do that. Bring to mind a different wound, a different trauma, and then go through this process with the Lord. Allow him to heal your wounds. Allow him to rescue you. Trust Jesus with all your healing.